Our dear Lord would not allow an innocent woman to stand accused. I think uh, somebody would say actually that our dear Lord did let innocent women be accused. Hi, I'm Malcolm Gaskill. I'm an expert in the history of witchcraft and I'm here to break down some clips of witches in films and TV shows. So now we're going to look at an episode of Doctor Who from season 11 called The Witchfinders. You stand accused of witchcraft and shall be tried by my ducking stool, hewn from the mightiest tree on Pendle Hill. If you drown, you are innocent. If you survive, you are a witch. This is a very familiar kind of uh, scene that I think a lot of people know about from 17th century witchcraft. So we're in Pendle. It's uh, probably around 1612 where there was a real witch trial where uh, 10 people were executed. And uh, here we've got a ducking stool, a woman about to be uh, subjected to the uh, the famous water ordeal, that if she uh, if she floats, then she's seen to be guilty, and if she sinks, then she's seen to be innocent. Everybody knows this kind of this kind of catch twenty two, but uh, this would never ever have happened like this. This is actually this is a ducking stool. Ducking was a punishment for scolds. It had actually had nothing to do with witchcraft. Although they did happen, it would a magistrate would very unlikely to have ordered this. Uh, and therefore was seen as superstitious, and it certainly wouldn't ever be part of the material evidence of a trial. I'll still be with you. In the water. In the fire. In the air. In the earth. Duck the witch! So I think what's really good about that is actually very poignant. The dry records of witchcraft, we don't really get that sense of emotion. And I think there would have been lots of very sort of passionate feelings, sometimes mixed feelings about whether this should be happening or not. This was a piece of community theatre, and I think this does come across quite strongly here, where people wanted to sort of reinforce their own notions about whether this person was a witch or not, and I think that does come across quite strongly, that you know, if this woman fails the test, you will immediately take it out and hanged. That would never, ever have happened. What you often miss from uh, films and TV shows is this sense of due process of the law, which might actually be less dramatic, but is actually really what happened. Who dares interfere with this trial? 35 witches we have tried and still Satan surrounds us. We shall not be stopped. So there's that sort of summary justice idea, the magistrate saying that they've tried, they're in this little place, 35 uh, witches that they've hanged. That could never, ever have happened. Is she alive? I'm sorry. So here the woman has died. But had this really happened, had villagers actually got an accused witch and put her in the water and she had drowned, that would have been a murder even in those cases where people sort of slightly extra legally uh, did subject suspects to the water ordeal, they either kind of hushed it up or they made sure that the person didn't drown because if they'd floated, then actually what they need to do is get them off to be tried by law. Right, so Doctor Who, uh, overall, I would give that um, a uh, 7 out of 10 for kind of dark fun, I suppose. Uh, for historical accuracy, I think it's actually got to be uh, 2 out of 10. Uh, so this is the most brilliant witchcraft film. This, this is um, Robert Eggers' um, The Witch. Must you continue to dishonour the laws of the Commonwealth and the Church with your prideful conceit? if my conscience sees it fit. These people feel themselves quite literally bedeviled out in the wilderness. This is a different kind of experience. These are migrants who are, are leaving behind religious persecution in England. But when they get to New England, they start you know, fighting with each other. And there are divisions about authority, and that's what you see here. And so this is a man who's about to be banished from his community, thrown out to go and you know, set up on his own on the edge of a forest and that's where things are going to get very sticky for him. Then take your leave and trouble us no further. How sadly hath the Lord testified against you. 
So there, because they can't resolve their differences, they are going to leave the, uh, the, this plantation and go off on their own. But this is also very, very sensitive to the idea that the devil is internalised. The devil is actually within people as well. They fled the devil in England and then they get there, they find the devil's there too. And so everybody's kind of accusing each other of straying from the path of righteousness, uh, having been tempted by Satan. Well, the, the music certainly helps that, but you sense very strongly that they're not going off to, to for happy fulfilment, going into a very different kind of danger, and that is very graphically in this film, um, a diabolical danger. Towards the end of the film, you do see scenes of witchcraft which come, which are very, very graphic, uh, of the witch's coven, of the witch's Sabbath meeting. But here you get a different kind of terror. It's the terror of actually really confronting real witches. And I think that really does make it a, a great horror film as also, and also a great kind of historical document as well. So Robert Eggers as the witch, um, I am going to give it a uh, 10 out of 10. I think it is an absolutely stupendous film and I'm also going to give it 10 out of 10 for historical accuracy. So now we're going to watch a clip from the 1993 film uh, Hocus Pocus. Such a competent American, Mr. Give him verbal like as black, just like this. No! Now, just a little bit of context there for the Sanderson sisters. They have supposedly sucked the life force out of this uh, poor boy's sister. They did think the witches were very much about the line between life and death and that they could manipulate and control that. The key emotion with witchcraft is envy. Witches were always thought to be envious. They wanted something. Somebody else's husband or they wanted somebody else's goat or they wanted uh, somebody else's youth or their baby and so on. But the way that most witches work is not by casting spells but by having malice in their hearts and forming a pact with Satan so that their very de internal desires are manifested as harm towards their enemies. We are just three kindly old spitzer ladies. Spending a quiet evening at home. Sucking the lives of the little children. As she says, we are just our old spencer ladies. Now, of course, Gender and age are very important for the history of witchcraft. But there is this idea of women kind of forming a, a coven or some kind of hellish knot. And here we see that, that classic kind of image. But outside, we've got another very important trope for the history of witchcraft, which is the baying mob. <laughs> we shall be back, and the lives of all the children shall be mine! <laughs> So this perpetuates uh, a myth, I mean obviously it's a, it's a children's film, but it does perpetuate the myth that witch trials took place in local communities and that it was all summary justice, which actually to the early modern state would have seemed very much like lynching and would have been a very disorderly and undesirable thing to do. But there are other well-documented cases of women going to the gallows and being extremely defiant. The idea that you'd curse the people that you were, were going to hang you, I think, actually uh, does have some kind of you know his, historical relevance. Well, for Hocus Pocus, I'm going to give that four out of ten. Um, for historical accuracy, I'm going to give it a five. I think that there is definitely something about these witches taking a life force. And I think even though this is an execution in the community, which never really would have happened, I think that sense of witches standing defiantly on the gallows, cursing their executioners, I think is just about right. So now we're going to see a clip from uh, Michael Reeves' uh, great cult classic, uh, Witchfinder General. The law has prescribed you methods of interrogation. And I have been blessed with the skills to carry them oh, out. stop your gabbling. We have work to do in Brandiston. So the, the famous Witchfinder General, Matthew Hopkins, there was only one of them, um, and he was in the 1640s, not in uh, 1612. Hopkins and Stern are heading off um, to, to the next village where they've heard that there are suspicions of witchcraft, exactly as they would have done in 1645. And one of the things that's touched upon here is actually uh, very true to 
the writings that Hopkins left and Stern left himself, which is that they had no actual uh, formal authority to do the things that they did, but they were able to establish themselves as investigators of witches. There'd been very few uh, witch trials in the 1630s. Now we're into the period of the Civil War where some of these suspicions and accusations are now coming to the fore again. And so that what the witch finders did in reality and what they're actually doing in the film is they're going in and encouraging people to come forward with their suspicions. And then the witch finders will give those people the confidence to take their cases to law. <laughs> what purpose is this? When the devil buys a soul, he marks the person's flesh. So we will know him. If such a mark is pricked, no blood will flow, nor pain be felt. There is an idea um, in the 17th century that when somebody forms a pact with the devil, that there will be some kind of, of numb, insensible part on the body, which if it were pricked, then it might not bleed and they wouldn't feel pain. And that would be another way of discovering proof. Not entirely sure whether Hopkins did or didn't do this, but certainly there were witch prickers up in Scotland and in Newcastle. The point of this, like the, the, the water ordeal, was that it was some kind of community theatrical action to build upon the, the, the pre-existing suspicions. And in private talk, you may shed some light on his innocence. Private. Yes, away from the distraction of the crowds. Perhaps in the quiet of your room tonight, you might be able to help me prove him guiltless. Would you release him now? I mean, this is all entirely fictional, but the legacy of Hopkins was that he was totally corrupt. And I think the fact that he might have been corrupt in sex as well as money, I think is, a, is, a, is something that was very authentic. But he's actually being challenged by gentlemen at the Norwich Assizes asking what is his authority for doing these things. They felt the world had been turned upside down and every Tom, Dick and Harry had declared himself to be a minister. And then meanwhile, the ministers were off fighting and being soldiers. And, you know, the Civil War was a, was a time when everything had been tipped on its head. So to try to restore that sense of order was very important. And I think Hopkins comes under that heading. Well, I think it's just a cracking film, so I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. For historical accuracy, it's a bit difficult because I think some of the spirit of it um, is very, very true to what I know happened, but that some of the details less so. So I'm going to give that 6 out of 10. So now we've got uh, an episode from the uh, Sky series, Jamestown. If you, sir draw down God's holiness into this piece of bread, then the piece of bread itself is holy. So um, what we've got here is, is, the, is an ordeal. So you're going to test whether or not this woman suspected of witchcraft is going to be a witch. Are you not drawing down the power of God? Well, this is Protestant Virginia, but this is a very, very Catholic understanding of the Holy Eucharist. Whatever the, the, the priest, or they would have called him the minister, is going to say, um, it didn't happen. Hear us, O merciful Father, we beseech thee and grant that we, receiving thy bread according to thy Son, in remembrance of his death and passion, be partakers of his most blessed body. So that's sort of a bit better, actually. That's, he, he doesn't contradict what she says, but he says in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice after the Protestant Reformation that the bread had symbolic significance. It wasn't actually a miracle, although they are now going to try and use it, I think, for to perform a different kind of miracle, to use God's power to prove whether this woman is a witch or not. Our dear Lord would not allow an innocent woman to stand accused. Neither should we. Well, I think some people would say actually that our dear Lord did let innocent women be accused, but that this caused quite a lot of anxiety to early 17th century people who really couldn't always tell the difference, and that they definitely did not want to try people who were actually innocent. Finding the proof of witchcraft, which could be used uh, in a court of law, it was about trying to find out the truth but that it was incredibly superstitious. No Protestant clergyman would ever have allowed this to happen. I think what is actually quite good about that is that you do have all the community there. They go there because they suspect, but they're not sure. And really, they want some authority to tell them whether the, their suspicions 
are well founded or not. Overall, I'll give this um, uh, six out of ten. It's got quite a good bit of uh, drama to it. For historical accuracy, I think I'll give it four because although that there's a, there's there's a good atmosphere in the uh, in the meeting house there, I think these these sort of very Catholic type of ordeal that they're using to determine this woman's uh, innocence or guilt, I think just would never ever have happened. So my favourite film from all the clips would have to be Robert Eggers' The Witch. I just think that that looks exactly right for colonial 17th century New England. It really is like a living nightmare. So it works very well as a horror film, but that's actually, I think, about as close as we've ever come in a film to showing the experience of witchcraft that many thousands of people once had. Thanks for watching. You can get my book, The Rune of All Witches, in paperback and audio by clicking to the link below. And don't forget to subscribe to Penguin for more videos like this.